Uh, hey, the Jacuzzo pin is still available. It's limited edition, only 250 were ever made. Here's a bunch of really awesome people who bought the pin online. Thank you guys so much for buying. I promise I would show their pictures in the next video if they send them to me. If they bought the pin and took a picture of it, here they are. Look at all their cool faces and all their cool pins. Get the Jacuzzo pin right now. Link in the description. Hey, did you know that Bionicle actually saved LEGO because they were actually doing really bad financially at the time and Bionicle was a hugely successful brand? Yeah, you did know that. Eight million other videos have talked about that and the history of Bionicle and the lore of Bionicle and how important Bionicle was and how it was... Screw that. I don't care about that. I don't care about cultural context or history or whatever. I am interested in one question. Were the toys that saved LEGO actually any good? If we strip away the nostalgia goggles, are these stubby, buildable action figures actually fun to play with? And what was it that made these toys so huge with kids in the early 2000s? Hi, I'm Jet Cuso. I like to nostalgically analyze toy lines, both new and old. And today we're focusing on the very first year of LEGO's hit, twice canceled powerhouse toy line, Bionicle. Part one, the Toa. First things first, the Toa. Times are dark and evil rules. Strange canisters drift ashore on the island of Mata Nui. Our very first commercial features a mysterious canister washing up on the beach, out of which explodes a bunch of parts that assemble themselves into a big, powerful robot man that does extreme sports! <laughs> Just like in the commercials, the Toa Mata came in silver canisters with a neat rotating sleeve gimmick. Incredibly modern looking and a highly distinctive shelf presence. Every child's first experience was literally reenacting the rad commercial, dumping out the canister and building the guy. Then sending them out into battle, I guess. With no enemy toys to fight, the main thing to do was to replicate the cool extreme sports angle from the ads. The building process is exceedingly simple. A few axles and ball joints snapped together and boom! Tribal Robot Power Ranger! In terms of action features, each Toa was equipped with a gearbox that you build inside its torso, a mechanic that allowed for more creativity than you'd expect. Tahu, Liwa, and Kopaka... Kopaka. Tahu, Liwa, and Kopaka, they all wield single-hand melee weapons, so turning the gear makes them swing their arms. You can generate a shocking amount of force with the weapons, which feels really, really satisfying. Mechanically satisfying, it's got a good heft, it hits hard, spectacular. Meanwhile, Onua and Gali have shorter weapons, so adding a third gear makes their arms swing back and forth to mimic climbing or, or swimming. Then there's the, the dirt one. The dirt one looks like a dork because his torso piece is upside down. But it's fine because turning his butt gear makes him kick his little boulder. Woo! Sports! If I'm being honest, the original Toa are kind of frumpy looking to a degree. The designers got a lot of variety in silhouettes by turning and adjusting the same components to create different builds, but they're all quite skinny and weirdly proportioned by any normal action figure standards. On the upside, the quality of LEGO plastic is so high that the figures feel robust. They're solid, the joints are tight, they hold poses really well, and again, that heft on the mechanics. The gears are strong enough that the impacts can actually knock the masks off of the other figures, which is important because the masks are the source of Atoa's magical powers. Different masks, different powers. The masks are held in by a looser sort of stud face hole thing than most Legos have, but it's on purpose because the masks are supposed to be knockoffable, which is good for when Liwa gets mind control to get. Come on, man! <laughs> There we go, that, that, that works. If you've noticed the cool, dynamic, glowing eyes through the masks, it's because the heads were constructed with these clear pieces that literally can't be removed after clicking them into place. 
It's a commonplace feature for Transformers, and I always liked the look. But if I'm being honest, I don't know if any of these details mattered too much to Bionicle's initial success, because at this point, the vibes in the advertising were impeccable. They did marketing events at Toys R Us, gave out free stuff, and the Toa came with CD-ROMs that would play full versions of the extreme sports scenes in the commercials. The focus on world building and mythos pulled child me right in, capturing my imagination with its dark atmosphere. I enjoyed my first Bionicle, which was a Toa Matagali that I knew nothing about, but the commercials and the mystique did something deeper to affect my little child baby brain. Despite all of this, there were probably a lot of people who found themselves becoming Bionicle fans even before they spent a cent on a Toa. Part 2. The McTorin. What you're about to hear is the most brilliant thing any toy company has ever done, and it's so obvious. These little guys are the Matoran. In the Bionicle universe, these are basically civilians. Normal guys that do their jobs and dance around. The endangered citizens for our heroes to protect. Matoran toys are cute as heck. Simple to build, compatible with any other Legos, and they throw discs shockingly well. And the best part? They were free! Happy Meals! These toys only came inside frickin' Happy Meals! At McDonald's! They might look underwhelming for a Lego set, but a Happy Meal toy with real Legos? Psh, get out of here! These things are choice Happy Meal toys. Lego quality plastic, a fun action feature, and hella collectible. Lego definitely lost a lot of money on them, but once I had a few of them in my hands, I wanted more. And Toys R Us was the place to get the big boys. These toys got me and my brother hooked, and the Toa reeled us in the rest of the way. Part 3. The Rahi On the island of Mata Nui, an ancient warning of great beasts. Beware, the Rahi have come for your masks. The third element of Bionicle's year one launch was the Rahi Beasts, animals infected by a dark presence on the island of Matanui. The Rahi were the first threat that the Toa had to face. They weren't really bad guys, but with the right lore, they kind of worked as bad guys. These big boy sets typically had a much higher price point than the Toa, but hey, that didn't stop us. Oh, uh, I'm reading here that it, it did stop us. It, it completely stopped us, and we basically didn't buy any of them, because it says here, we were babies and not wealthy. <laughs> I wasn't a builder kid, so to me, these always looked like much cooler sets from an action perspective. Each was designed to be held kind of like a pistol, with triggers that activated their unique attacks. A few years back, I found the instructions for the Nui Rama set, and homebrewed one out of parts that I had at home, and man, I like it. Much like the Toa, the wing flap mechanics are so satisfying and hefty, and when facing a Toa, they... Discombobulate. They easily smack a Toa mask off if you get the aim right, and herein we find a new play pattern. Every Rahi had masks on their front, forming eyes or claws or ears, but mostly forming targets. You and a friend, or you and you, could fight one of these guys against a Toa, or two of them against each other like Rock'em Sock'em robots. If a Toa wins, they can remove the infected mask from the Rahi to free it, and if the Rahi wins, they can infect the Toa and turn them evil. Then you can fight your evil Toa against your good Toa, and it's just a grand old time. The effort to put such hefty and effective action features into these building sets really makes up for the limitations of the toys as action figures. Obviously, they're not terribly posable, but who cares, cause whatcha, wha, wind fly! And that's every main Bionicle product from 2001. Oh, um, right. Part four, the Turaga. <coughs> Boomers! <coughs> the Turaga are nothing. The cheapest possible combination of the fewest parts possible, as an entry-level product right above the McTorin. They're just some old, old men. But at least they provide more unique masks. 
masks were a huge part of this toy line. Toa had them, Rahi had them, everything had a mask. They sold booster boxes of them that we called mask boxlets as kids. Sometimes the mask boxlets would have rare gold masks, or sometimes sets would come with rare masks, or a store would hold a promotion for a rare mask like the copper mask. And sometimes your local Toys R Us is closing a few years ago and all the shelves are gone, and you find a rare Bionicle giveaway mask on the floor 18 years later, and an employee just says you, you can just keep it. This is a Bionicle mask. Yeah. We have one of these. It's incredibly rare, and we found it on the floor over there. Can you find stuff? Just... <laughs> I'm not gonna this got off track. Point is, the masks were a neat collectible, and their unique designs remain as the brand's most iconic imagery. With mask boxes being such a cheap product, like just a few dollars, it felt like there was a Bionicle toy to buy at literally every price point. No matter how much allowance you had, if you were at the store, you could get something, and that felt good. Part 5. The Deep Lore Okay, let's get this out of the way. Bionicles aren't robots. In universe, they are beings of organic tissue and organs supported by an armature of mechanical solidified protodermis. What's protodermis? <laughs> I don't know! Go read the wiki! Anyway, that's where the Bionicle name comes from. Bionicles are both biologic and mechanical. Smash together bio and mechanical and you get nothing! I lied! The name actually means Biological Chronicle. Which is weird, because nothing terribly biological happens in the story, right? <laughs> okay, it's time. I can't avoid it any longer. What's going on here? Who are these robots? Why are there robots in a tropical island tribe? And why do they look like this? What on Aquamagna is even going on? Hey, Vakama's a liar, man. He's a liar. He's complete. He's making it up. It's not true. <laughs> I know I said nothing very biological happened in the story, but that was also a lie. You see, every single character in Bionicle is a microorganism living inside the body of God. Literally, most of the story takes place inside and in the water surrounding the body of a giant sleeping god robot. In year one, the island of Matanui is the sediment-covered face of the god Matanui, floating in an ocean on an alien world. And then, in the prequel, they're inside his brain. And then, they're up in the... Oh, no! Yo, fuck up! Basically, the Toa are white blood cells, the Makura are an autoimmune disease, the Barak are a fever, and it was Osmosis Jones the whole time. The Matoran is the powerhouse of the cell! So, point is, uh, Bi Bionicle has a lot of uh, lore going on. The Bionicle universe is absolutely massive, but we didn't know that when it came out. It seemed simple when we were kids, just some cool robots fighting monsters on an island. And yet, a then unknown mythology crept and slithered through every corner of everything they made. A mysterious red star roaming the sky. Ancient hidden masks, an unknown, formless evil, an army of robots destined to destroy everything, and six heroes who inexplicably wash up on an island in canisters. Every corner of Year One of Bionicle oozes with the unknown, and every corner you looked into you'd find ten more mysteries. Every mystery solved was another unanswered, and answers were there. They existed. Every bit of the truth of the story was foreshadowed and hinted at constantly. But we didn't learn about the giant robot thing until like seven years in. And yet, on this original map of the island, you can see the shape of a head and shoulders underneath the surface of the water. Even on the very surface, Bionicle drips with mystery. Look at this canister package, for example. That looks like a robot in a jungle. Why is there a robot in a jungle? Why is it swinging around like Tarzan? It's not obvious, and when the answers to questions aren't obvious, a very, very beautiful thing happens in the mind of a child. Imagination. Part six, aren't we forgetting something? So this whole time I've been talking about Bionicle like they're just action figures. And for a lot of kids, that's all they were. You build them once, and you just play with them as they are. And even in that respect, the play feel of the toys as action figures is solid. And Bionicle's world building inspired more imagination than pretty much any other brand at the time. 
distinct characters and distinct roles in a world where absolutely anything could be right around the corner. That's very fun to immerse yourself in. But aren't we forgetting something? Legos! Oh my god, that's right! They were Legos the whole time! I can make anything I want! Oh my god! First you fill kids with imagination and wonder and mystery, then you give them a toy where their creativity is only limited by how much frickin' plastic they can buy! Whoa! But LEGO didn't even rely on the kids to figure that out. They taught you that you can make other things out of these toys. A lot of the characters had combined forms. You disassemble the figures and rebuild them together to form bigger, badder heroes or monsters. They don't really look good, but the point is, once they're disassembled, you might as well rebuild them into whatever you want. And you know we were making Bionicle OCs 24-7 when I was a kid. Custom Toa and Matoran, new Rahi to populate the island, etc, etc. But that was more my brother's jam than mine. He was a Lego kid, I was a Transformers kid, but we could both play with Bionicle and try to understand the mystery of it all. Bionicle was a brand you could fully immerse yourself in. From watching, to reading, to building, to playing, to creating, it created more of a full package than most toy lines ever even aim for. So were the Bionicle toys good? Yeah. Yeah, they were good. And if you didn't find them complex enough, you could just rebuild them into something that more suited your fancy. You see, when you inspire enough imagination in your audience, even without the customizability that Bionicles had, the simplest toys can become much, much more. Thanks for watching! Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the little bell icon down below so you never miss an upload. The 1 in 250 limited edition Jet Kuso pin is still available, so click the link in the description to get that pin. And you can also find the link to my Patreon in the description if you want to see more videos like this. If I see a whole bunch of patrons after this video, that's gonna be amazing, because there's a lot more Bionicle that I can talk about. So if that's something you want to see, show support in whatever way you can, and post a comment saying what Bionicle topic you would like me to make a video about. Or even what other toy lines you'd like me to take a look at. Thank you so much for watching, this is Jet Kuso, and I'll see you next time. Huh! Wow, we have a bunch of new patrons. Welcome Logan Hill, Mudorios, Lucid Lana, Joe Schmo, Lee, and Crofton Sherwood, thank you for joining the Patreon. And thank you to my Diamond Patrons, Chell and Immortal Blank, my Titan Patrons, Shivitis, Sierra 107, Varano C, Big Chunga 69, Wong Wump Shadow, Gusano, and Juice Man ZYT, my Hyper Patrons, Gavin Greenlee, David, Bin Wong, Trouble, Dusk Anthro, and Merrick, thank you so much, your support means everything.